Hello everyone. My name is Jerry Lowe. I'm the head of technology for advertising and marketing at AWS. Welcome to reInvent, our first virtual reInvent and a very big welcome to the AdTech track at reInvent. This is a big session today, so let's jump right in. The use of identifiers such as third-party cookies or device IDs will be eliminated within the next two years. Reaching your consumers via external partners will be impacted, and in some cases, dramatically so. These events will make the ability to synchronize your user data across your company to enable the use of that data to effectively reach your users even more important than it is today. The good news is your CDP or data platform will be the star of the show. But building such a DSP is a complex task. In this session, Muraladhar Krishna Prasad, or MK, the SVP of engineering at Salesforce and the architect behind Salesforce CDP, will share with you how they built their platform, hosting thousands of customers, each with their own CDP, processing billions of records and exabytes of storage. He will also share the blueprint and the lessons learned along the way. Your feedback drives what we do. So please, click on the CSAT score at the end of this presentation, and if you like it, a high score will allow us to come back. So with that, a big thank you and a big welcome to MK. Hello everyone, welcome to this session in AWS reInvent. I'm Murlidhar Krishna Prasad, an SVP of Engineering in Marketing Cloud, Salesforce. This session, you're going to see a lot on how, in Salesforce, we built the customer data platform to really unify all of the customer data at exabyte scale. We are really going to look at the background and how we built it on top of AWS. Uh, before we go into the presentation, uh, first things first, uh, as a safe harbor, you may be hearing a lot of things in the presentation that may be forward-looking. So make sure any purchasing decisions you do, uh, you look at the product, use it before you do so. Let's dive right in. As you know today, the consumer has gone all digital. Right? All our physical events are virtual, live events are on demand, retail is all about e-commerce, for, even for here is now for to go. So what does that mean? As a business, for you to thrive in this environment, you really have to go digital. But what does going digital mean? Going digital just doesn't mean uh, fixing your technology and making it all digital. No, going digital means the ability to be able to connect with your customers, modernizing it, connecting where they are, whichever device they are, uh, uh, choosing the right content and delivering at the right time, right? And for that to happen, it's really hard. And why is it hard? Because your data is spread across so many different systems. It's all siloed. And the technology changes are going so rapidly that you need a lot of skill sets to also make that happen. But key to really digitizing this human relationship for you to have that, we feel is data. Because as a customer, they're gonna to touch point with your company or with your business through all of these things, whether it's sales, service, marketing, commerce, your backend systems. And we in Salesforce, call this thing the single source of truth. You wanna bring all of that data, all those customer information, all the event and everything together into the single system of truth. What does single system of truth have? It really, we need to first resolve the customers because it's uh, customer information may be represented differently across all of these systems. You need to obviously have single sign-on through all these systems to link them together. Obviously, privacy, consent, and governance is important, but more than all of it, you need a data platform which can actually pull all this data together so you can actually reason, analyze, and act on it. But building such a customer data platform is not very easy. It sounds easy, right? All you need to move is data, put it, uh, put it in a warehouse, and life's great. No, it's not. If you really look at the fundamental architectural principles of building such a platform, first, if you are a multi-cloud business, you need to be worried about the cloud agnostic models. But more than anything, security and compliance become paramount. You need to, this is customer's private data, so it has to be secure by default. 
And not just that, you have to adhere to all of the new privacy rules uh, across uh, US, Europe, uh, and rest of the world. But beyond that, if you look at any classical big data, because this is gonna be data from across all your assets, right? From your website clicks, to your mobile apps, to your CRM systems, and so on. So this is a lot of data, this is big data. If you look at any traditional big data system, you need to worry about five Vs, right? What are the five Vs? First is the data variety. You've got to handle data with different schemas that are coming in from your engagement systems, from your behavioral systems, uh, various industries, and so on and so forth. The next is data velocity. You're gonna be having these batch systems that are gonna be giving data in batches, right? In gigabytes and terabytes. You also have to deal with event data that's gonna be streaming in uh, at high speeds and high velocities, like hundreds of thousands of requests per second. Then you have to deal with data veracity. If you're gonna have sources, data sources coming from a lot of these systems, you may have the same customer with different zip codes, different addresses. How do you make sure that you trust the right source. So you need to worry about the lineage. You got to reconcile all the data and create those golden records. And that's called the truth profile. And of course, once you've collected this data over time, it's going to just keep growing and growing and growing. So data volume becomes the next big challenge on all this. Finally, the whole reason you're doing it is all is data value. That means you need to integrate all this data into your both data analysis, visualization systems to make reasoning, as well as to all your engagement systems where you send your emails or coupons, your websites, and so on and so forth. Finally, this is often lost. People don't realize it. You don't build the system once. You want to make sure it's a platform on which you can continuously build your application. So you need a customizable application platform on top of it. I'd like to introduce Customer 360 audiences from Salesforce, which tries to meet all this bar and also make it super easy for anybody, a marketer or anyone else, to be able to use the system. How do we do it? We built on the Salesforce Lightning platform, so we give you the application platform, and we do all the things a CDP needs to do, which is to be able to unify all your data, identify, reconcile, segment, enrich the data, manage consent, activate to all our engagement systems, and of course, visualize and understand that data. But more than anything else, this CDP that we have is a declarative platform. That means clicks, not code. And this declarative platform also works at scale. And the rest of the session, we're gonna be talking about how we achieve that and how this works on top of AWS to give you that petabyte and exabyte scale. So how do we do that? As you know, the Lightning Platform, the Salesforce Lightning Platform, is impressive in terms of the extensibility that it offers. Extensibility for users, extensibility for developers, in terms of data models and other things, a full learning platform called Trailhead, a consent platform, and the industry is one of the largest app exchange platforms for applications. So we took all of that and kept that in the Salesforce Lightning Platform. So that means your UI, as you can see here in the screen, you can see the UI, the look and feel, everything, and the data model, everything lives in the Salesforce Lightning Platform. But we all know Salesforce Lightning Platform is a B2B platform built for that scale. Here we are gonna be talking about petabytes and, and uh, exabytes of data. So we took all of the data and all of that processing and that those microservices live in the public cloud on top of AWS. In the future, we'll have other clouds as well. Today, it's all on AWS. So the rest of this uh, talk, we're gonna be focused on that uh, microservices, how we built it, how we actually run it. But it's important to realize that this is fully integrated with the Salesforce application platform so that it's a declarative CDP. All right, so if we dive into the background, so how does it look at uh, like a 50,000 foot level? This is a set of microservices, the customer data platform, the set of microservices using a whole bunch of AWS services. We use a load balancer uh, for obviously getting all the requests. Uh, everything runs on top uh, on Kubernetes clusters. We have our ingress gateways and outbound, we have the public proxy and all of this is protected via a VPC. But before we go into each one of these services, it's really important for us to look at what was the service principles that we used when we built all of this stuff. There were like four things that we uh, really did. First is the cloud native foundation. What does that mean? We wanted to make sure there's a common foundation so that as we go to all the other clouds that we don't re-implement things. So these are common things like security key walls, 
uh, monitoring systems, uh, debugging and measurement, S uh, C uh, Salesforce, uh, our uh, CI CD systems, right? All of those things. So that forms the sort of the core foundational layer. The next is our principle was an immutable infrastructure. That means we use Terraform and others so that you can always deploy and these uh, as much as possible. We try to run them as stateless services that can be easily redeployed. And a zero trust architecture, really important as you go to the public cloud, that we don't trust anything. So every communication, every storage uh, is all secure. The next big thing always is an issue when you go to a public cloud is, okay, what do you use? You have the plethora of services that say AWS offers or things that you can run on your own. So we chose it in this priority order. The first is if there is an opportunity for us to take a cloud agnostic open source or even something we built our own and we could run it uh, easily, then we preferred that option. So examples are things like Kafka, Spinnaker, Istio, gateways, and so on. The next level we said, okay, like let's take databases or let's take uh, running all the Hadoop or Spark jobs. We said, mm, okay, we know the runtimes are the same. We could still sort of port it everywhere else, but let's go uh, to sort of cloud native for the management plane. So things like EMR, EKS, and RDS fall in that picture. The third level is where if there is a cost, huge cost advantage, performance advantage, or there's just no other option, and that, then we chose the exclusive cloud native solution. So in this case, like things like S3 and Dynamo. The third principle that we all used is monitoring, measuring everything. Every service, every call is monitored and measured so we can actually raise alerts. So we know through this microservice jungle, we know if anyone fails, we have an alert right away. The fourth thing is uh, often sort of forgotten until you get the bill at the end of the month is watching costs like a hawk. So the first uh, advice that I would say is we created a cost model from the beginning of the project so that we can really understand where the costs are. Like reading from storage, if you create segments, what will be the cost, approximate cost based on the sizes uh, and other things. This model helped us a lot to know both how we are behaving as we run the, these things and also to be able to have price cards. Uh, and finally, definitely look at your costs, create those cost-based alerts. Uh, so even if you have other issues, it can quite reveal things. Like in one of our cases, some of our Presto clusters wasn't quite scaling down and we could clearly immediately see uh, the next day that the cost was going up and we were able to quickly track it. So that talks about the big microservice principles, but let's now jump down to CDP itself. In CDP, we have sort of four big areas. Like I said, uh, we had the five Vs of big data. So we try to uh, compartmentalize into these. First is the ingest. Ingest is how we bring the data. And that's where the data velocity becomes an issue. So how do we handle it? We will look into that, how we handle that microservice of it, a part of it. Next part is we have to deal with all the data variety. So we'll talk about how we harmonized it into common canonical models and how we stored it. Third is resolution. Like I said, the same customer, the same account can be represented differently in different things. And so how do you harmonize it together and to create a unified uh, profile? And finally, we're gonna be talking about the data volume and value, how we did the analysis and engagement. So let's dive deep in. At a 10,000, now we're going one level deeper, right? So we first start with the storage stack. So that's with any traditional big data storage stack. We have uh, file storage where all the files are stored uh, and they are stored in uh, ORC format today. There's a hot store for us to be able to supply data fast, uh, certainly a SQL metadata store for the metadata and a Hive meta store for all the big data processing. On top of that is the traditional compute for big data, that's Spark, Presto, and Airflow. We use Airflow for all the workflow engines, Presto and Spark for querying and doing uh, data processing. On top of that, we have all of the data modeling aspects, whether it's event data or uh, data models uh, for the file data, and all the ETL transformations as the data is coming in. Finally, you have all of the CDP services themselves, so microservices like identity resolution, segmentation, and so on, on top of that. Obviously, data has to come in, so we have a full-blown connector infrastructure uh, to various systems, including CRM, marketing cloud, third-party connectors via App Exchange and the activation channels on the other side to messaging, advertisement channels, uh, personalization channels, the data analysis via Tableau Datarama, and a whole control management plane of all of these microservices, and then to sort of tie it all together, 
a lightning-based app setup and metadata. Now, this is the high-level architecture, and if you kind of go down deeper, okay, if you just put on your AWS lens and see what it has, at the storage level, we use S3, DynamoDB, and RDS. RDS, obviously, for storing all the metadata. And for all the big data processing, we run all our Spark, Presto, and other jobs on top of EMR. All our compute runs as Kubernetes uh, on EKS. And we, we use CloudWatch a lot, along with scaling uh, and the IAM. And, and we use simple queue servers. And as I, as I said before, we also host our own Kafka servers on top of EC2, as well as uh, SQS for simple communication. All right, let's jump into each of those microservices and see what we have done and also what we have learned from it. First is ingest. Uh, like I said, data velocity becomes a big issue here, both sort of streaming uh, data as well as the batch data. In the case of streaming data, we have to be able to handle over hundreds of thousands of requests per second spread across. So we created a beacon infrastructure, which is effectively Java servers that are quickly able to process your request and put it back into a Kafka queue in the back. And we sort of deployed across data centers for scale. The Kafka brokers obviously handle these quickly. And uh, on the backend side, we have EMR running Spark jobs that can process either the event streams coming in from Kafka or uh, the bulk streams that are coming in through our S3 interfaces. The key thing is here is engagement streams, which are typically read-only. We make sure it's partitioned so that as so much data, volume of data is coming in, we can quickly put them into partitions and you don't have to load up the whole uh, sort of ORC files to update them. Next is data variety. And this is a little interesting. As I said before, the same contact can look different when the contact from CRM will come in, say, as contacts uh, entity. From marketing cloud, it can come as subscriber entity. From your mobile web app, it can be coming in with just email addresses and nothing else. So one thing we have worked hard is to create this industry standard information model working with Amazon, Google, and others. It's called cloudinformationmodel.org. What it does is it has created industry standard reference models for everything for your business. So like accounts, contacts, leads, orders, commerce entries, and so on. And what we allow is as the data is coming in, they're mapped into data streams, but you can easily with a WYSIWYG interface map them to these data models. Think of them as views on top of your uh, data that's coming in. Why is it interesting? Because once you've mapped it, let's take a user, you mapped it to an individual entity. You don't have to worry about where the data came in. The rest of your processing in your data platform can just work off of, those, off of these models. And it also allows for industry vendors to ship their own models, like loyalty, hotels, and so on and so forth. So that's super useful. In addition, the way we actually implemented it was to store, obviously, all of these models in Salesforce. So it's totally extensible from just from the Lightning Platform perspective. But from a big data perspective, that gets mapped as a hive table. The data streams get mapped as a hive table. The models become views on top of them. And from a storage perspective, I kept talking about it before, we store them as ORC format, so it's queryable and retrievable fairly fast on, from S3. We've also made sure that this can scale to like tens of thousands of tables very easily. The next part, so we have ingested, handled data velocity, we have now harmonized, created a canonical model. Now the next part of it is the veracity. So like I said before, you may have an email address from one place, you may have a first name, last name, and it may be different individuals. So you need to resolve them so that you can actually merge the individuals together. And that's where identity resolution plays a huge role. So what this does is it takes all of these data points and tries to get either probabilistic or deterministic match to say, you know, the email from here and this are the same, or the person's name look kind of similar, so they're probably the same person, so that you can actually unify. This is important because it's that single unified profile which helps you figure out that all of the events that the person did, maybe they browsed an item on your website, they looked at your mobile app, or they made a sales call or a service call, that they're all the same person. So you can really look at that person's holistic history, and not just person, accounts, brands, any other profile that you want to. So this, we run it by using uh, Spark jobs uh, that run at scale on top of all of these uh, 
individual entities, and we are talking billions and billions of rows, right, that we are merging together. Uh, and then we are creating this unified individual, but we also store all the lineage. So we know uh, how to resolve the result. Let's say if two individuals are the same, how do you now resolve their email address and zip code, which one do you give preference, and so on. Uh, in addition, we also link it back to all of the events and engagement data, so you can actually create a holistic view of all of these events. The, the next part of it, now that you have ingested, harmonized, we have identity resolved, is to now have applications on top of it. One application that we have today is called segmentation application. So it's a declarative uh, segmentation job. So you can just literally drag drop. You don't need to know SQL or anything. Uh, and as you can see in the screen here, we show you all the relevant uh, attributes for you to sort of create that segment. This gets translated into an EMR job that runs at scale on top of all of the data and keeps it up to date all the time. And once you have segmented, you want to activate to all these various systems. That includes messaging, S3, uh, or other, uh, other third-party vendors as well. And the challenge here is, of course, data volume that we have to deal with. And that's kind of why Amazon EMR, coupled with spot instances, have been a great thing for us. And this is uh, interesting, and we will talk about that as well. One of the things we, instead of having every little microservice directly calling into EMR, we built this job as a service framework. Uh, to be able to isolate them. And this has helped us in many ways, right? One is, of course, it gives us the cloud agnostic model so we can switch easily to other vendors. But more interestingly, it's been, we have been able to use all of these uh, spot instance uh, magic that AWS gives us. As an example, spot instance fleet. We use the instance fleet to be able to uh, work with spot instances without getting disrupted or to be able to use S, uh, EBS instead of SSDs and scale them appropriately based on the jobs make sure there are no noisy neighbors, uh, have uh, capacity-based routing algorithms, and also be able to try all these new things like A-B testing of new features or no, even new uh, instance family types like Graviton or other instance family types without having to change the rest of the CDP processing. So that's been extremely useful for us and highly recommend uh, anyone if you're using it to create sort of these uh, shim layers to help. The final thing is the value. Like I said, the value is there. Uh, you want to be able to visualize the data uh, with Tableau, Datorama. You want to be able to integrate into all these personalization systems or your websites to be able to quickly access the data. And if you're just storing it in S3 and doing Presto, yes, you can actually do data analysis, but that's not going to give you the sub-second response times. And so for that, we use the part of the data, the unified profiles and others that are required for fast access. We've copied that into DynamoDB. And the reason we did DynamoDB was because we know we could access data in like sub like 10 milliseconds, even at 40,000 RPS. And you can easily scale it up and down, right? The read and write throughputs. And so we use DynamoDB to be able to satisfy those real-time requests and then for any other non-sort of real-time or data analysis, we use Presto running on top of uh, the big S3 uh, data lake. So we saw quickly how we are able to bring data, we're able to harmonize the data, we're able to unify the data, and be able to sort of uh, have applications such as segmentation and activation on top of the data, and be able to get the value out of the data by integrating into Tableau and other engagement systems. But there's this journey, uh, we've learned a lot of lessons, right? Uh, and so we will, I would love to share some of the lessons that we learned. Uh, first is spot instances. Uh, while it looks simple, spot instances can save you a lot, a lot of money. And if you can see on the right side, this is from uh, AWS's chart showing how even if you do RI upfront for three years, spot still saves you a lot. And over on demand, it saves you over 50%. Uh, cost. And particularly the new Graviton instances uh, that are being rolled out can save even 45% costs over on top of that. So spot instances can really help you save a lot of money, particularly if you're doing a lot of big data processing because every segmentation, every query, everything involves running all of these things, whether it's Presto or Spark. And the more data you have, the more data you process, it needs a lot of compute instances. And so spot has been huge for us. But one thing with Spot you will learn soon enough is that Spot, by definition, is disruptive, meaning if there is a request for a high priority request, 
the VMs can be yanked away. So you got to make sure you choose the right family. And so this is where having an instance fleet helps you because you can kind of distribute your load across multiple spot families so that even if one uh, set of VM instances are not available, you can quickly go to the other one. And as you can see, we have an RDN Studio product uh, that views spot instances very heavily. And you can see just last year how much it has helped us just moving into the instance fleet, like over 3% improvement in availability, just moving to that. And remember that it's not just about your SLA, it's also the cost because if a Spark job is stopped, you have to restart again if you run out of Spark instance and that costs money as well. So it's both for saving money as well as making sure you have less interruption and have a better SLA. Next, our learnings in using Spark and Presto are Spark is huge. Uh, before in Audience Studio, the other product that I talked about, we used to use a lot of MR processing on text files. Just moving to Spark helped us save like over half a petabyte of intermediate file saves because Spark caches it in memory. And not just that, if you're using Spark on text, obviously use ORC because if you use ORC, you can get over 70% reduction in EC2 because the, just the data processing, you can save a lot uh, on the compute as well, not just the storage. But if you must use uh, text, please do use S3 Select with Spark. That helps a lot. And I cannot emphasize this enough. Uh, choose obviously the right compute. If you need more memory or more disk or more network, choose the right compute. And AWS is awesome at giving you that. Uh, but more than anything else, auto scaling. Like just looking at the graph, anybody can tell you something happened uh, near the end. This is where we turned on auto scaling for Presto. Because auto scaling by uh, automatically shrinks or expands your VM pool, be it for Kubernetes clusters be it for even Presto or Spark. And that can save a lot of money. Uh, and so, this, so saving money is just not just for compute, at storage as well. Uh, even though S3 is super cheap, it adds up, right? A petabyte costs about $22,000 uh, a month. And if you keep your log and if you don't, if you keep on retaining all of the logs slowly, it just adds up uh, even over weeks and months. And so definitely reduce your log. Because reducing a log is not just about storage savings. If you must do GDPR or other kind of things, that is also going to help you with your CPU savings as well, your compute savings. Another thing is also partitioning your data. Make sure you partition your engagement data by date ranges. And as you can see in the image below, uh, just using date partition, even the Presto workers, the amount that it had to scale to process the data is far lower than if you don't partition. And finally, make sure your billing model uh, looks at your resource usages and you do the right guardrails. So to summarize all of this stuff, what have you learned so far in this presentation? Customer 360 audiences, we help marketers unify their data to enable more personalized interactions. It's an exabyte scale declarative customer data platform. It uses the power of the extensibility of Salesforce platform and the scale of AWS. It's built for marketeers by marketeers, and it's a self-service data platform. And finally, it unleashes it for all ISPs to be able to extend this platform, either at the data model, connectors, or activators to, for vertical industries. It's been a great journey for us, working with Amazon AWS. They've been a guide on this journey. And the main reasons we did this is obviously we get the compute on demand. We could spin up a whole new data center uh, and region in just a few weeks, unheard of if you uh, did your own hardware. Right security controls is really important for this sort of secure data. And so AWS gives us all those knobs needed. The choice of compute has been really useful for us. And as I said before, things like Graviton has ha helped us a lot in cost savings along with all of the spot tier market that they have. And finally, tiered storage has been super helpful for us to reduce the cost of storage as well. And more than all this technology, it's been the customer-centric culture of Amazon that has been extremely useful. We've been able to work very closely with Amazon uh, AWS team, and they've been very responsive to all our issues and also work with us on all the new feature asks, feature requests, as well as trying out new beta. So it's been a great journey for us on top of AWS. And if you need more information, you can learn more about the cloud information model on the links uh, that are there in the slides. 
Uh, you can also get smart. If you want to learn more about Customer360 audiences, uh, please visit our Salesforce website. And we invite all developers, ISVs, and end users to you use this platform. So thank you again uh, for listening to this talk and hope you benefited. And we benefited immensely from using AWS and hopefully you can benefit from that too. Thank you.